Okay, we're going to continue handling control flow today. I think I gave you a whirlwind tour of branch prediction algorithms yesterday, which hopefully were exciting. Today we're going to look at some more issues in control flow handling. And I need to leave early, so uh, we'll try to stop early, the latest at 2.30, which means that we may not have very long breaks. <laughs> not that we had long breaks before. <laughs> okay. So uh, remember, we've started control dependence handling. We talked about the problem. We talked about six solutions, but we covered only one, really. And we, that one was guessing. Well, we covered really two. The first one was not interesting, right? Stalling the fetch engine until you determine the next fetch address. And then we covered guessing the next fetch address uh, and a lot of algorithms. Today, we will start with trace caches, which we built up to and then talk about other methods of handling control dependencies. And if we have time at the end, we will cover more trace caches and uh, block-structured ISA, block-based execution. But we will need to build up to that. So your second lab is on branch prediction. It should be out later today. You'll have fun optimizing some branch predictors and implementing your own branch predictors also if you want. So there's significant extra credit that you can gain by trying out different branch predictors. As I said, this is a topic that has fascinated many people over the years, and this is one of the most complicated parts of the engines, uh, ex execution engines that we have in modern processors, in addition to the out-of-order execution circuitry. Okay, so you can do the readings to do your assignments better as well, and you remember these readings. Okay, this is where we were. Basically, I think last time we stopped at the super block, if you remember. Uh, I showed you that super block is a single entry, multiple exit block, and it's essentially a trace uh, is a sequence of dynamic instructions, which we will talk about traces, but I introduced the term trace earlier. It's a sequence of executed dynamic instructions. Right? You can optimize a trace. A, stra a trace can have multiple entries and multiple exits. Uh, a, a super block uh, can actually have... Uh, single entry and multiple exits. And we're going to talk about that. And we remember that we eliminated the side entrances in a super block by duplicating the tail, if you remember. Uh, getting, rid of the basic, uh, getting rid of the side entrances enabled us to do some code optimizations that we couldn't otherwise do. Remember the common sub-expression elimination exp uh, that we did yesterday? OK. So if, you, if, you're, if you're not here yesterday, you should definitely study the slides because we're going to build upon that. OK, but one of the things Superblock enables is it enables, uh, it's, it's essentially a form of basic block reordering. Uh, it enables you to lay out code that's going to be executed frequently in a sequential manner. As a result, your branch, predictors are, branch predictions are more likely to be correct. So if you're doing, uh, if your branch prediction algorithm is always predict the next sequential address, and if your code is laid out nicely such that next sequential address is the more likely address that you would go to after a branch, then that's nice. That was the reason that we were looking at uh, these optimizations. And that way you can also enable very, very wide fetch as well. If you're fetching 16 instructions per cycle, you're not limited by those branches because you laid out your code such that the next instruction that you're supposed to fetch is the next sequential instruction. And on top of this, you can enable some optimizations by getting rid of these side entrances to this long sequential block. OK, so this is software. Basically, software can actually reorder code such that uh, co I think we're having the same problem here, so I'm going to reduce this. Uh, software can reorder code such that fetch breaks are minimized. Now let's take a look at, can we do that in hardware? Remember yesterday's, in one of the first slides, I said software can do this. But what about hardware? And the idea of trace cache is doing essentially the same thing in hardware, invisible to the software. Basically, as I said earlier, a trace is a sequence of executed instructions. It's specified by a start address and the outcomes of the control transfer instructions within a trace, meaning branches, right? So basically, you have a starting address, and then you say the first branch is taken, the next branch is not taken, and that's my trace. <laughs> Okay, and it turns out traces repeat. Programs have frequently executed paths. You can imagine that from a loop, for example. 
you may actually have A, B, C, D here, and you may be always executing A, B, D, 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 right, as a control flow path. And the idea of trace cache is to store a dynamic instruction sequence in the same physical location so that it could be fetched, fetched in unison. Basically, if you're doing A, B, D, A, B, D, A, B, D, store, that, store all of that sequence in the same physical location. We don't do that in current I caches, right? A is stored in some place, B is stored in some other place, D is stored in some other place today. Instead, we're going to combine this dynamic sequence and store it sequ sequentially in a single cache block. That's the idea. And this is the pictorial example. So this is the instruction cache, for example. Assume these are basic blocks. Remember, basic block is a single entry, single exit block, uh, which means that there's no control flow inside it. Uh, a and B happens to be sequential. C happens to be in some other cache block. D happens to be in some other cache block. E happens to maybe span multiple cache blocks somewhere else. And assume that the program always executes this frequently. The idea of trace cache is identifying this frequently executed traces and storing them together in the same single cache block, such that when you fetch it, you get all of them at the same time. And if this is the frequently executed path of your program, then you're most of the time correct. You can feed your white fetch engine this way. Make sense? Maybe you can fetch even 256 instructions at the same time, assuming this is very frequently executed. Okay. Basically, uh, the idea is dynamically determine the basic blocks that are executed consecutively and traces consecutively executed basic blocks and store those consecutively executed basic blocks in physically contiguous internal storage. That's called the trace cache. Another picture of this, this is the dynamic instruction stream. When you observe the program executing, you keep seeing ABC, 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 ABC. And at some point, the processor uh, figures out that these are frequently executed, puts them into the trace cache, and it fetches from these consecutively stored basic blocks. Of course, to be able to fetch from it, you need to predict the next trace, right? Now you have a prediction problem. You don't predict maybe... Uh, you, your fetch problem is solved because all of this is sequential, but which trace to fetch becomes a problem. Basically, you need to somehow predict the control flow, and based on that... You need to predict a trace. Uh, you could predict individual branches, or you could predict traces. Now, if you're operating based on traces, now you could imagine building a predictor for traces, right? That's operating uh, at the level of traces, not individual branches. So my current trace is this, and I predict my next trace is going to be this one. My next trace is going to be that other one, dot, dot, dot. And you could actually use some principles similar to the branch prediction uh, we discussed yesterday to be able to do trace prediction as well. Basically, the only difference is the granularity, right? The granularity is much higher with traces, uh, whereas it, you may not need to predict individual branches. So this is a design, design choice that we will not go into as much unless we get to the end of this lecture and we still have time. Okay. Uh, of course, while you're executing this, you will see the branches, and the branches will be resolved and then you need to verify whether you fetched the correct trace. Right? Basically, you need to verify the executed branch directions with the stored ones. If you fetched the wrong trace, then you will need to do something. Either flush part of the trace or go back to the beginning of the trace and fetch some other trace. Make sense? So there are a lot of design choices here. If there's a mismatch, you flush the remaining portion of the trace. That's the intelligent thing to do, of course. For example, if you predicted that you're going to execute ABC and you fetch this trace, let's say 16 instructions, and when you executed this code uh, really in the engine, it turns out this branch should have gone to D, you flush C, and then you fetch D. That's the idea. Of course, maybe you fetch a trace starting from D. Now, this, this should immediately uh, bring the question, what if I sometimes go to ABC and sometimes go to ABD? And I have two frequently executed paths, ABC, ABD, ABC, ABD, ABC, ABD, ABC, ABD. Well, do you store both of them in the trace cache? And that's a design choice, again, in trace cache. That's one problem with traces. They lead to redundancy. So ABC and ABD may at the same time be in the trace cache at different locations. Now you're 
usage of the instruction storage may not be as efficient as an instruction cache because in an instruction cache, A is in only one location, B is in only one location, C is in only, only one location, right? So this redundancy problem actually is a problem in trace caches. Okay, so this is a trace cache example. Again, uh, you may actually have instruction cache and a trace cache. You may have both, uh, and people have proposed it th that way. Uh, so this is an instruction cache. First basic block is here, second basic block is here, third basic block is here. And maybe, uh, before, how do you build this trace? That's a question also. Uh, initially, you're running out of your instruction cache, you keep fetching this, and then you figure out, maybe after fetching, or at the end of retirement, you figure out that you've executed this trace. At that point, you can fill this trace into the trace cache in the physically contiguous line. And then the next time you get fetch address A, you fetch this one instead of this basic block. Make sense? Of course, it's a better idea to predict the branch directions as well. Uh, so we'll, we'll get back to that. Maybe trace cache, how do you index the trace cache becomes a problem also, right? Do you just look at the fetch address? Or do we just look at the fetch address and multiple branch predictions that come after it? This doesn't show that uh, picture over here. But basically, if there's a trace cache hit, you take, out, you take the instructions from the trace cache. If there's a trace cache miss, you take the instructions from the instruction cache in this microarchitecture. Now, this was not the design in Pentium 4. In Pentium 4, there was no instruction cache they basically filled everything into the trace cache. And if there was a trace cache miss, they would first form the trace and then uh, fetch from the trace cache. Okay, any questions? There are a lot of design choices here, so we're not gonna cover everything over here. Okay, uh, this is another example. Let's see, what, what do I want to show? This shows, for example, uh, again, th this has an instruction cache over here and a level two instruction cache. Uh, and you basically supply the fetch address to both the trace cache and the instruction cache. And trace cache maybe provides multiple traces. As I said, A, B, C, and A, B, D may be both stored in the trace cache. Then you have a choice. How do you, how do you pick which one to choose? Well, if you have a multiple branch predictor, if you can predict multiple branches, branches ahead, then you can pick the right trace. So instead of predicting the next branch, you predict three branches ahead. Now, you can imagine that problem is much harder than predicting one branch, right? So that's one downside of a trace cache. How do you predict the next trace, if you will? Uh, okay, and if the trace cache again hits, or maybe a trace cache can partially hit, if, if you have A, B, C, and A, B, D, you can pick one of those. This is called path associativity. It's a different kind of associativity, right? You, both of them start with A, but the path is different. One of them goes through ABC, the other one goes through ABD. Now you have path associativity in the trace cache. <laughs> you need to select the right trace and supply it to the uh, execution engine. Okay? Any questions? The, the basic idea is very simple and beautiful, but once you get to the implementation, there are a lot of design choices, actually. Much more than instruction cache. Okay, so this is the multiple branch predictor that uh, Sanjay Patel used in his thesis. Uh, by the way, this paper, I should go back. Uh, yeah, this is another paper that received the Test of Time Award 20 years later, actually last year. Uh, and this idea was being developed by multiple different groups, actually three different groups. Uh, one is at Wisconsin, uh, the other is at Michigan. And the third one is actually has a, has a patent, uh, Intel has a patent on this idea. Uh, they all have their differences, but it's, it's, a, it's an idea that was developed concurrently at the same time, which kind of shows that people are thinking about similar issues at the same time, because everybody was trying to develop these wide fetch engines such that you can fetch many instructions uh, at the same time. But these guys were the lucky ones to receive the Test of Time Award because they were able to publish at Micro, and none of these other guys were. <laughs> well, <laughs> luck. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is the multiple branch predictor that uh, the Michigan folks used, uh, and they basically showed, showed that it's, it's a very simple uh, predictor. Instead of storing the two-bit counters only for one 
branch, you store it for multiple branches. Make sense? That's the idea, basically. This doesn't work too well. <laughs> I've tested it also, actually. <laughs> but it's, so for example, the first branch's prediction accuracy may be 95%, but the next branch's accuracy goes down and down and down because uh, you're not, you don't even know which branch you're predicting at this point, right? There may be a lot of interference uh, from other branches because paths change. Okay. Okay, so what's in a trace cache? Uh, I'll, just to give you an idea uh, of what's stored. Uh, again, this is the design from Michigan, but you have 16 instructions because they wanted to be able to fetch 16 instructions per cycle. And instructions are stored in decoded form. That's one of the nice things about a trace cache. You can actually skip uh, the decode part because you've already executed these instructions. You've already decoded these instructions once. Why don't you store them in decoded form in the trace cache? Intel Pentium 4 did this also. So they got rid of a lot of the decoding energy by storing instructions in a decoded form in trace cache and improved energy efficiency. Uh, now this is actually, conceptually, these are separate ideas, right? You can store decoded instructions in a cache. It's called a decoded instruction cache, but they don't have to be traces. Conceptually, these are really orthogonal ideas. Trace is really a dynamic instruction sequence that spans across multiple branches and the goal of that is to give you a white fetch, irrespective of where the branches go. Whereas decode, uh, storing instructions in decoded form gives you energy efficiency so that you don't need to decode the same instruction over and over and again. And you don't really have to store instructions in, in terms of traces if you want to get the benefit of a decoded iCache. In fact, people knew how to design decoded iCaches much earlier than they started doing trace caches. But if you're doing traces, it just makes sense to store everything in decoded form. Uh, okay, up to three branches can be stored per line because they needed to predict those three branches. And the third branch ends the uh, trace cache line. Okay, and each instruction is marked with a two-bit tag. Okay, you can imagine. So there are four target addresses with three basic blocks per segment and the ability to fetch partial segments. There are four possible targets to a segment. The four addresses are explicitly stored, allowing, allowing immediate generation of the next fetch address, even for cases where only a partial segment matches. Partial segment is what I described earlier. You have ABD, but maybe you want to fetch just AB, right? But your trace cache is ABD. That's a partial match. And that actually links in your critical path if you want to do that partial match at the fetch engine. How do you, how do you figure out that you need to fetch only AB portion, not the ABD? Again, your multiple branch predictor tells you which direction uh, these need to go. And path information. This field encodes the number and direction of branches in the segment, and it includes, includes bits to identify whether a segment ends in a branch and whether that branch is a return from subroutine instruction, blah, blah, blah. So, okay. <laughs> Basically, there's a lot of information that needs, metadata that needs to be stored together with the trace. That's the takeaway point over here, to be able to fetch the correct trace uh, and also uh, uh, skip the decode stage. Okay. And if you're interested, you can read, uh, this, uh, this is actually a beautiful PhD thesis that covers almost all of the issues that you would like to know about trace cache design. Okay, so let's, let's get back to the higher level and talk about the higher level advantages and disadvantages compared to an instruction cache. Basically, clearly this reduces fetch breaks, right? Assuming branches are biased and you can predict them. Uh, you can fetch sequential code over here because you stored them to be sequential. And you didn't modify the compiler, right? You didn't modify anything for this. Super blocks, uh, you, you don't need to do super blocks for this to work. The hardware does it internally. Of course, it comes at a hardware cost. There's no need for decoding. Instructions can be stored in decoded form. That's also nice. And you can enable dynamic optimization within a trace, just like you could do in a super block with some hardware cost again, right? So you're pushing the complexity into the hardware to be able to do this. We're going to see one, of, one example of this in a little bit. Of course, the downside is the hardware cost, right? It requires hardware to form the traces, more complexity. This is called a fill unit. So if you go back to this picture, there's a fill unit over here. So after you execute the traces, you know which dynamic in sequence of instructions you've executed, and that gets filled over here. And after the metadata that's added, you pull, uh, pull, stuff it into the install it into the trace cache. That fill unit is important. And as I said, it results in duplication of the same basic blocks in the cache, ABC, ABD, ACD. I don't know, maybe ACD doesn't work. 
But yeah, basically, there could be a lot of redundancy in the trace cache, uh, which means that you may need a larger trace cache to store the same amount of information as a smaller instruction cache, because here there is no redundancy. And it can require the prediction of multiple branches per cycle, as we discussed, if multiple cache traces have the same address. And we've already discussed this, right? I gave you the example of ABC and ABD. This, uh, this has XYZ and XYT. And the problem becomes worse if your traces are longer, actually. If you want, let's say, a 256-wide fetch engine, instruction-wide fetch engine, you will need to predict more branches, right? Or predict longer traces. OK. Uh, there, there are many design options here. I'll, I'll cover a couple of them. Uh, well, I'll cover one of them, actually, uh, and one code optimization. This is one that's important, uh, and this is one that we have discussed also, right? There are many high biased branches. Uh, and remember, in the branch prediction case, we said, oh, you could handle these biased branches much more simply with a simple predictor, such that the more sophisticated predictor can be reserved for much harder to predict branches. We have a similar idea here, basically. It's called branch promotion. And the idea is you usually want larger traces, uh, but uh, a trace cache is limited by how many branches you can store uh, in a trace because of the metadata that we've discussed. So for example, in this case, we have this trace ABC, and it turns out we have only 11 instructions in ABC. But we want 16 instructions if you want to build a 16-wide fetch engine. If you figure out that this branch B is almost always taken to C, which means that it's highly biased, we can do an optimization that merges B and C. Now we're merging the basic blocks. It's, it's kind of like super blocks. You're merging them. But we're getting rid of the branch over here, basically. This is called branch promotion. Uh, promote them uh, to branches with static prediction. Basically, we're not getting rid of the branch. We still know that there's a branch, but it's really a static prediction. Saying that, oh, I'm going to predict this branch as always going to C. So I'm not going to use the trace caches branch predictor or hardware branch predictor for this. I'm always going to assume that this is going to happen, except if it executes and it tells me otherwise. <laughs> right? Now, the benefit of this is you got rid of that branch from the perspective of predicting the next trace, so you've enlarged the trace. Now you can actually put another basic block into this trace, because this branch doesn't exist for all practical purposes for construction of the trace, which means that you have 4, 7, 11, and 14 instructions of the trace now. Make sense? So basic, the basic idea is to promote highly biased branches to branches with static prediction. This leads you to larger traces, just like this. And there's no need for consuming branch predictor bandwidth. That was, we, we, we already knew that idea from before. And now you can also enable optimizations within trace. So this BC, because you're assuming that this branch is uh, statically predicted, you can actually do a lot of code optimization within this. Actually, we're going to do more. We're going to be more aggressive in a little bit. Of course, the downside is now you need to figure out how to determine highly biased branches. I told this yesterday that it's not hard. And this is one circuitry that determines highly biased branches. Basically, you take the branch address, and maybe you have a separate table. Maybe this is part of the BTB. BTB is not a bad idea. And uh, you basically keep track of which direction the branch goes, and you have a saturating counter. And if you have enough number of consecutive occurrences that go the same direction as before, you promote the branch as a biased branch, saying it keeps going the same way, so I'm going to predict that it's going to go the same way. Make sense? So we're adding more and more hardware, as you can see, though. <laughs> this, is, this, is not, this is coming at a cost. OK, so that's one example of optimization in the trace cache, such that you can better utilize the trace cache. What else can you do? So fill unit actually. Uh, the ability to form these dynamic traces in hardware enables you to dynamically optimize the code also without the need for software. And a lot of people have taken this to the next steps. We may talk about that uh, if, we, if we have time at the end of this lecture. But uh, as we said, fill unit constructs traces out of the decode instructions. And it can also perform optimizations across basic blocks. We've already seen branch promotion. But beyond branch promotion, you can treat the whole trace as an atomic execution unit. You can say, when I start this trace, I'm going to execute it to the end. 
And if for some reason that's not true, meaning that I predicted, uh, I fetched the wrong trace, I'm going to go to the beginning and start executing it slowly. That's the idea. Either all, atomic means either all or none of something is executed. All or none of the traces retired. If all of the branch directions are correct, then you can retire the entire trace. Now, if you know that the trace is going to be executed atomically, you know that this is really a code piece that's in unison, that's not going to be separated. You can do a lot of optimizations in the code. You can move the branches earlier, you can move the branches later. As long as you respect the data flow dependencies, you can move one piece of code from uh, a location that's at the very end to the very beginning, right? You may not be able to do that movement if there were branches in the code, if you assume that there are branches. But assuming that this is atomic gives you the freedom that, oh, there are no branches in the code. There are branches. If those branches go the wrong way, meaning not the way that I assume the trace is constructed, then I'm going to go back to the beginning of the trace and maybe execute in some other way. Some other way meaning maybe I execute it sequentially. I go back to the instruction cache and fetch every instruction one by one as opposed to going through this trace because this trace is optimized for this particular path. Make sense? So that's the beauty of this. Now the, this enables many optimizations across blocks. You can eliminate dead code, for example, because the code may be dead assuming this path, but if you come from a different path, the code may not be dead, but you're assuming this path because you really are assuming some particular branch directions. You can reorder instructions. You can do stuff like this, for example. Like this is, uh, this is basically reassociation, right? You're reducing the height of this dependence chain. Here, Rx uh, is equal to Ry plus 4. Here, you take Rx, add to 4 to it, and get Rz. If there was a branch in between them, you may not be able to do this optimization. But now you're assuming that branch is gone. You can do this optimization. That's the idea. And this paper actually describes a lot of uh, optimizations uh, for trace cache processors. And let's go back to this, our optimization. So remember, our optimization was uh, the realization that this R2 times 3 is a common sub-expression in these multiplies. Uh, and if this was the only path that we were taking, we could simply rewrite this multiply R3, uh, uh, multiply R2 times 3 into R3 as multiply, well, we could convert this multiply into a move. Move R1 to R3, right? If this was the path that we were taking. And with a super block, we got rid of this side entrance. As a result, we were able to do that. With a trace, we have essentially the same issue. Basically, we ignore this side en entrance or exit. Doesn't matter. We're assuming that this is the code that's executed. Now the fill units can do the exact same optimization internally because it's assuming that this is atomic. Right. And if it turns out that this branch is supposed to be taken, then you flush the entire trace, you go back to the beginning, and you fetch from the instruction cache, let's say. Make sense? It's fun, right? It's amazing that you could do this completely in hardware. And actually, later work uh, tried to uh, form even larger blocks, larger atomic blocks than just traces. What if you had a thousand instructions that are atomic that you could form in hardware and you could keep track of them? You could optimize code across those thousand instructions. Now, that's not implemented in modern processors yet, but it's, it, showed, it showed significant benefit from that. Okay. Okay, so this is implemented, as far as I know, at, at least one processor, uh, and that's the Pentium 4. Basically, they replaced the L1 instruction cache with a 12,000 micro-op trace cache. Uh, and it stores decoded instructions and cracked instructions. Cracked means these are complex x86 instructions. They convert them into uh, smaller instructions, like RISC-like operations, simpler instructions. Uh, so basically, all, uh, all of that uh, decoding is done before the trace cache. So trace cache actually stores instructions that are decoded and cracked. And it can basically fetch six micro-operations every other cycle because you could, you would, uh, this was a three-wide engine, three micro-operation wide engine. Now the x86 decoder is off the critical path. So if you look at this, and they use the BTB, for example, for trace cache to predict the branches, and you can read this patent actually to figure out how it might work. Uh, that's the patent I mentioned earlier. Uh, 
but basically, they would fetch the instructions, uh, decode them for the first time, fill them into the trace cache, and then the trace cache would, this is the regular pipeline operation, trace cache, well, this one. Trace cache would supply the instructions to the pipeline. So there is no iCache, there is nothing else over here uh, to be able to actually supply instruction to the pipeline. Only trace cache. Which means that now you can save a lot of decoder energy also. Because x86 decoder actually is a beast. If you ever built one, you know that it's a beast. It's not easy to build and it's very uh, energy consuming because the instructions are very complex. Especially if you're doing wide fetch. Remember, uh, I, I mentioned uh, you, you have a problem with predicting which instruction to fetch, even if you don't have a branch, if you have a variable-sized instruction. Right? So you have a variable-sized instruction here. And you're trying to actually fetch and decode, let's say, three instructions per cycle. How do you do that? You don't even know where the next instruction starts because you haven't decoded the previous instruction because you're trying to do all of them concurrently. So this decoder is built speculatively, assuming that some instructions... Um, many instructions are, not, uh, are, 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 are of some size. Basically, the, there are many, many parallel decoders here. Uh, the first decoder, for example, is a very complex decoder that can decode the instruction that it has. It has to. But the other decoders, let's say you're fetching, uh, decoding three instructions per cycle, the other decoder over here is, assumes that the previous instruction ends at some place. And based on that assumption, it speculatively decodes the instruction. And the other decoder assumes that the other instruction ends at some place, and based on that assumption, it decodes the other instruction. But they don't have only one prediction, they actually have many predictions, so they do a lot of parallel decoding at the same time. As a result, this is actually a very complex decoder over here, not just because uh, instructions are complex, but because uh, instructions are variable size and you're trying to decode multiple instructions per cycle. Now, if you don't use that decoder, you store everything in decoded form in trace cache, and hopefully you hit in your trace cache most of the time, then you get rid of a lot of that energy that you consume in decoding. So that was one of the big benefits uh, of this trace cache in Pentium 4. It made up for a lot of the other inefficiencies in other parts of the engine, actually, <laughs> which you may <laughs> be familiar with. <laughs> okay. So it's, uh, this also enables, uh, enables uh, the fact that this uh, uh, decoder can be simpler and slower. Although you've got to be careful with that, because if, if your code is not friendly for a trace cache, then if, if you make this decoder too simple, you're really creating a bottleneck for the other code that doesn't work well with the trace cache. And that was one of the issues with Pentium 4 also. Initially, this decoder was not... That good was wimpy because they relied on the trace cache, but then they had to improve this decoder a lot because not, not all code actually worked well with the trace cache. Okay, any questions? Is this a fun idea? Cool. Okay, uh, we may get back to trace cache uh, if we have time at the end of this lecture, but I want to cover other ways of handling branches. Now let's look at the other four ways. So we've talked about stalling the pipeline, bad idea. Branch prediction, good idea, but which one to use is always a problem. Uh, let's look at four other solutions. Uh, uh, this solution is interesting uh, because it's, it's a lesson, I think. Uh, it's also a bad idea, <laughs> but we'll talk about uh, why it's a bad idea. Uh, basically, the idea is, again, simple, and it may sound like a good idea initially. Uh, you change the semantics of a branch instruction such that it's delayed. Right now, the semantics we have for a branch instruction is the next instruction that you're going to fetch in the next cycle is really the target or the fall-through. Basically, the branch takes effect right away. The idea in delayed branching is branch takes effect after n instructions or n cycles. Now, we already have a choice. Which one do we specify? Right. Okay, let's, say, let's pick the instructions one. Basically, the idea is to delay the instruction of the branch and instructions that come after the branch in sequential code layout are always executed regardless of the branch direction. This is called a branch. This n is called the delay slots. Basically, you have some delay slots. Let's assume n is 1. The next instruction that's sequential after the branch is always executed regardless of what the branch does. Okay? Of course, now we have a problem you have to put something into that delay slot. 
for this to be effective. How do you fill that delay slot? Right. Branch must be independent of the delay slot instructions, obviously. You cannot move an instruction there. And the instruction must be independent of the direction of the branch takes, of course, right? So for example, if you have an unconditional branch, it's easier to find instructions to fill the delay slot, of course. You can, fill, uh, you can take an instruction from the target of the branch and put it over there, right? That's easy, because you're going to always execute the next instruction. Or you can put a, find an instruction that's independent of the branch in the same basic block before the branch and put it into the delay slot. But conditional branches pose another problem. Basically, now condition computation should not depend on the instruction of the delay slot. So it's difficult to fill the delay slot. And also, you're conditionally jumping to the target. If you move an instruction from the target basic block into the delay slot, if you're not going to take the branch, you have a problem, right? OK, so let's see this. So let's assume that this is our normal. Let's, let's first see the benefit, potential benefit. This is our normal code. This is a sequential code layout. And these are dependencies, data flow dependencies. We have A, B, C, and the conditional branch to X. X is the target. And then D, E, F, G. These are instructions. And let's assume we have a two-stage pipeline. I make life easy. Instruction fetch and execute. In the first cycle, we fetch A. In the next cycle, we fetch B. In the next cycle, we fetch C. In the next cycle, we fetch branch conditional. Now, without the delay slot, we need to wait for the branch uh, to resolve. Or let's say we mispredicted the branch. Basically, you have a bubble in the pipeline, in the small pipeline. And uh, let's assume that branch is taken. Then you fetch G only after a single bubble. Of course, if you predict correctly, then you're fine, right? But this shows the case where you don't predict correctly. OK. So basically, this takes six cycles, even in this two-stage pipeline. Uh, if you use delayed branching, one way of laying out the code would be to take this instruction that's independent of the branch, and that's also independent of either of these blocks before the branch, either of these instructions before the branch, and move that to the delay slot. If you do that, we know that we're always going to execute it, and it's independent of it's part of this basic block. It's part of the single entry, single exit block, block and it's going to be executed. Right? So that's the only instruction we can move into the delay slot over here. Make sense? Now, if we execute this, you fetch A in the first cycle, C in the next cycle, branch conditional in the next cycle, B in the next cycle. You don't need to predict the branch. You don't need to do anything to the branch because we're assuming that the branch takes effect after this instruction. And we already computed the uh, target of the branch in the execute stage, so we, we know that we should fetch G in the next cycle. By having a single cycle delay slot, we've avoided predicting the branch. Right. So now we have five cycles instead of six cycles, which is a significant improvement in this two-stage pipeline. Right. Of course, it's a toy. Now the question is, can you always find an instruction to fill this delay slot? If these were all dependent, A, B, C, a is, uh, B is dependent on A, C is dependent on B, and the branch conditional is dependent on C. What do you fill it with? Anybody have any guesses? Can we help with the yeah, so it's not, it's, it's, not only, it's not an unconditional branch, right? This is a conditional branch. So it works even with a conditional branch over here as long as you can find an independent instruction. Yeah. Basically, if you don't have that independent instruction, what do you fill it with? No op, no yes. <laughs> Basically, no op. <laughs> and you're back to square one, <laughs> meaning that you haven't solved the problem, because no op is essentially this. <laughs> you added an instruction, but it's not a useful instruction. <laughs> OK, so that's the problem with this approach. Well, we'll see more problems. But let's also look at uh, some things that people try to improve this approach, because this approach was actually proposed by reduced instruction set uh, uh, approach initially. Uh, this was one of the bad ideas related to it, I think. Uh, basically, what they said was uh, the, the philosophy, the reason this was introduced was we don't want the hardware to do anything. If you took my class in digital circuits, uh, 
the, the reason uh, the reduced instruction set computers came along was hardware was too complex for some people. And they said, we should move the complexity to software. Hardware should be as simple as possible. That way we can design a very, uh, so a very high frequency processor, for example. And we can get the performance from the software. So from that perspective, this makes sense because now hardware doesn't need to do branch prediction. Right? The software just needs to figure out these instructions that you can put into the delay slot. Uh, so uh, Spark and MIPS actually have branch delay slots. So we got rid of it in your assignment. MIPS actually has a delay slot, but you're not going to have to deal with it uh, when you're actually doing your assignment because it doesn't make sense. But Spark, these ISAs in reality actually have delay slots. Uh, so people, some people in the world need to deal with it. So Spark has it also. But they also had something interesting to make this more effective, the ability to fill the delay slot more effective. So they, they had this thing called delayed branch with squashing. But then hardware needs to do the squashing. OK. <laughs> anyway, so the semantics is if the branch falls through, i.e. it's not taken, the delay slot instruction is not executed. You squash that instruction. So why could this help? Let's take a look at this normal code. Well, the same thing that I'd said. Here, you cannot fill the delay slot right? in the previous example. So you have an op. But with, if you have delayed branch with squashing, what you could do is you could fill the delay slot with an instruction from the target of the branch. So you basically fill it with A, assuming that the branch is going to be taken, and hopefully this is going to be taken a lot. It's a loop. And if it's not taken, the hardware guarantees you that it's going to be squashed. The delay slot instruction is going to be squashed. This enables you to fill the delay slot more often, but it gives you more hardware complexity. Now, it's not as beautiful anymore. right? Now you have to do squashing. And the philosophy is broken, <laughs> unfortunately. OK, okay let's go into uh, advanced and disadvantaged a little bit. So the advanced is, of course, it keeps the pipeline full with useful instructions in a simple way, assuming that the number of delay slots is equal to the number of instructions to keep the pipeline full before the branch resolves. And all delay slots can be filled with useful instructions. Both of these need to be true. Uh, and I've already shown, hopefully, that this is not easy. <laughs> The second one. And the first one actually creates another complexity that's very difficult to solve, right? Which is, how do you know how many delay slots you really have? This is very microarchitecture dependent. But the instruction needs to be specified in the ISA. So the problem here is, uh, well, I already said this. We're going to get back to it. But it basically ties the ISA semantics to a particular hardware implementation that people had in mind. And that, act that is actually very dangerous. And that's, act that's something that is not a principled approach. No one should do, in my opinion. Basically, people, when they design Spark, MIPS, HPPA, they assume one delay slots. And how many cycles of branch penalty do you think these processors have today? 10, 15? <laughs> Around that, actually. So this one delay slot is essentially useless. Why? Because it adds additional complexity to the hardware designer now. You have to implement branch prediction, and on top of that, you have to take into account this delay slot and ensure that it works. So that's the downside. That's, that's always the problem with tying ISA semantics to a particular hardware implementation you have in mind. It's usually better not to assume a hardware implementation. And what if the pipeline implementation changes with the next design? You always have this problem. OK, let's get back to this not easy to fill the delay slots, even with a two-stage pipeline problem. Basically, number of delay slots increases with pipeline depth and superscalar execution width. Remember, we've, we, in our example, we said uh, uh, if your n is 20 and w is 5, we have a 100-cycle delay slot, right? If we cannot even fill a delay slot of one instruction, how are we going to fill a delay slot of 100 instructions? Good luck with that. That's, that's very tough, actually. And number of delay slots should be variable with variable latency operations also, because branch may resolve at different times, right? If you have out of order execution, for example. OK. Any questions on delay slots? Let's look at uh, uh, the code optimization a little bit also. This is, this is really an aside. Uh, so uh, as I said, uh, this is just to give you a little bit more information. Uh, but basically, you can fill the delay slot from instructions from before, meaning the same basic block or previous, 
You can basically move. Uh, I'm trying to look. Oh, yeah, that's right. Basically, you have this delay slot over here. You can move this instruction over here into the delay slot, assuming it's independent, data independent. So this is movement within the same basic block. So this is actually easy to do. That's usually safe unless you're moving some load instruction and then you're debugging your code, right? You may actually get some uh, uh, wrong, wrong exception in a place that you don't expect. But these are actually a little bit harder because now you need to take into account both safety and correctness. Uh, so for example, in this case, uh, you have this branch and the delay slot over here. And let's say we want to fill the delay slot from the target. And the target of the branch is over here. We basically move the subtract over here into the uh, target. And the question is, if this branch uh, is now not taken, do you add a new instruction to the not taken path? You need to, right? <laughs> because you've changed the semantics. <laughs> So there, there's actually more things that you need to do. It wasn't as easy as I've discussed. You need to add a new instruction to the not taken path. And you need to be careful which instruction you move. What if this is a load instruction that faults, that gives you a page fault? So there, there are safety issues over here also. You need to maintain both correctness and safety. Here, again, uh, you have this branch and the delay slot. And let's say we're going to fill the uh, delay slot from the fall-through path, which is, this is the fall-through path. Basically, you move it over here. Then the question is, uh, for correctness, do we add a new instruction to the taken path to undo the effects of this instruction? Basically, you will need to, you're executing this instruction regardless. If you're moving from only one path, you need to make sure the other path is also correct. So you need to undo the effects. And you need to also ensure that these optimizations are safe, meaning you don't get an exception that actually leads to a program crash in, an, in, a, in a point uh, that the programmer doesn't expect. That's usually a problem with uh, optimized code. This, you, can, you could view this as a code optimization uh, as well. Uh, and it, it's hard to debug optimized code because things are moved around, and you don't expect things to be moved around if you're debugging a program, right? That's why when you're debugging, you usually don't debug optimized code. But then these optimizations are important also. <laughs> so yeah, you have a problem, basically. So it's not as easy to do this code movement. And if we, as I mentioned yesterday, if we have a static scheduling lecture, we will cover this in more detail in the future. Is this clear? Okay, perfect. Okay, then we can move to the next one. Next one is actually uh, very interesting. It's fine-grained multi-threading. It's one of my favorites. And you have some questions in your uh, homework to do this. And we've actually covered this before. Uh, when we talk about GPUs. <laughs> so basically, the basic idea is very simple. Uh, the hardware has multiple thread contexts. The context means program counter plus registers. Each cycle you fetch from a different thread. Now if you do that, you ensure that you don't need to predict the branches or you don't need to deal with any dependencies within a thread. Because you know that you won't have an instruction from this thread until, that until the only instruction you have from the thread retires and finishes. That's the idea. By the time the fetched branch or instruction retires or resolves, no instruction is fetched from the same thread. This way you guarantee you don't need to have dependency checking. Right? And this is an example over here, basically. It's, it may not be the best example, but it's a picture from the, one of the first papers that proposed this. Basically, every cycle you fetch from a different thread. Uh, which means that you're really overlapping the latency of the branch or the instruction. Again, this is not specific to branches. For every instruction you do this. Uh, you're overlapping the latency with the execution of the other threads' instructions. And if you have enough threads, this is great. And if you don't care about the latency of that particular thread, this is great. So the big upside is there's no logic needed for handling control or data dependencies within a thread. Uh, of course, the downside is single thread performance suffers. <laughs> so if you really care about this particular thread, too bad. You're not going to have an instruction uh, for n cycles later from this thread. You're, so you're not utilizing the pipeline uh, well for that thread. Of course, you need to have extra logic for keeping thread contexts, and that forms a scalability bottleneck for this. 
And uh, of course, it, you do not overlap latency if there are not enough threads to cover the whole pipeline. Right. Okay. So this is actually a, a general latency tolerance technique. You can think of branch as a long latency instruction. Branch is resolved after five cycles, let's say. Uh, you're really tolerating that latency. But the, you could use this to tolerate memory latencies also. In fact, in GPUs, uh, there are many reasons why this is used in GPUs. But one of the benefits of fine-grained multi-threading is overlapping long latency uh, operations to memory. Many, many threads can be accessing memory, but it's fine-grained multi-threaded. As a result, you're overlapping those latencies. You keep fetching many, many threads. And the reason it works in graphics engines is uh, because imagine you have millions of pixels that you're operating on, right? You divide the execution to many, many threads, and you can actually overlap the latency of many, many threads in those uh, while they're operating on these millions of pixels. Okay, so idea rephrased. You switch to another thread every cycle, such that no two instructions from a thread are in the pipeline concurrently. Uh, this tolerates the control and data dependency latencies by overlapping the latency with useful work from other threads. And improves pipeline utilization by taking advantage of multiple threads. And this was first proposed, actually, it's a really old idea, uh, by uh, Jim Thornton in, in this machine, Control Data 6600, uh, which was actually the first out-of-order execution machine, which did not employ the Thomas Law's algorithm because Thomas Law came, at, came up with it concurrently uh, in 1965. Uh, but basically, this, had, uh, this machine had an I.O. latency, memory access latency of 10 cycles, and they wanted to overlap this latency with I.O. operations from different threads. So they had a fine-grained multi-threaded engine controlling this memory access, essentially. At that time, I.O. is the same as memory access. Uh, basically, they had a fine-grained multi-threaded engine to access memory at that time. So they had a 10-threaded engine at that time. And this is another paper uh, which I would probably recommend you to read uh, that uh, popularized the idea uh, also. It's, it's the heterogeneous element processor. So let's go over it a little bit. I think I already said this. The processor executes a different I.O. thread or memory access every cycle, and an operation from the same thread is executed every 10 cycles. That's the idea, basically. By the way, this is, a, this is an interesting processor because IBM was building its uh, 36091, which is supposed to be the supercomputer of that day. And this was a really small company uh, that competed with IBM, and they were faster than IBM. Uh, but then IBM took over, and they, they were able to actually <laughs> design the fastest supercomputer at, at that time. And this is also the first machine with out of order execution, but it's also one of the first machines, uh, first machine with out of order execution that doesn't have precise exceptions. So out of order execution is a good idea, uh, but the fact that it didn't have precise exceptions uh, disabled the programmers from using it because you cannot debug the program, right? Instructions retire out of order, they execute based on the data flow dependencies, but the programmer doesn't know what to expect. That's the beauty of the von Neumann architecture. If you have a sequential instruction stream, you know that this instruction should be retired before this instruction and not after this instruction. Right? So you know exactly which instruction should be retired when. So you know what to expect from a program. But if the machine is retiring instructions in an order that you don't expect or you don't know, how do you debug that machine? That's one of the reasons why this, uh, this machine was not very successful. And uh, same as the reason why IBM 36091 was not very successful, even though it was very high performance. It was not programmable by at least sane people. <laughs> and most people are sane, I think. <laughs> okay, that's, that's a side story. But you can, you can review my out of execution lecture for more uh, on, on this, as well as IBM 3691, and precise exceptions also. Okay, the second machine that also popularized this idea was uh, later by Burton Smith. Uh, it, it was called the Heterogeneous Element Processor. Basically, it had 120 threads per processor. I think this is more or less a predecessor for modern GPUs, in a sense. Uh, and it basically had available queue and unavailable queue, waiting queue for threads. Each thread can have only one instruction in the processor pipeline, and each thread is independent of every other thread. To each thread, basically, the processor looks like a non-pipeline machine. That's one good way of thinking about fine-grained multi-threading. It's not perfectly true, but uh, it looks like a non-pipeline machine. So there's a huge trade-off that you make between system throughput, you're assuming a lot of threads, versus single thread performance. You don't care about single thread performance if you're not designing a machine like this. And assuming you, your single thread performance doesn't matter and your aggregate 
overall, many, many thread performance matters. That's a good design choice, right? So in heterogeneous element processor, the cycle time was 100 nanoseconds. This is late 1970s. And you had eight stages, which means that you had 800 nanoseconds to complete an instruction, assuming no memory access. And there was no control and data dependency checking, just like a GPU pipeline today. And let's see. And that's, the, that's Burton. <laughs> But basically, if you look at uh, look over here, uh, if you read that paper, uh, a thread, okay, this is this is basically you would fetch an instruction. Threads would be waiting in the queues. Uh, a thread would be in this queue, uh, thread ID, and when you fetch the instruction, the thread ID would be removed from this queue, and it would basically travel with the thread, and it would go into this queue if you need to fetch data from memory. So when you remove the thread ID immediately you're making the thread non-fetchable, right? Because it's not in the fetch queue. These are, this is the queue of the threads that you're going to fetch from. You have, you have the thread ID as well as the program counter. But you remove it from the queue that travels with the instruction that you're executing word threads. It may go through this perform function. It may go through this perform function. It may go through this data memory. And if it goes through this data memory, it sits in the queue waiting for its result. And then it comes back depending on which operation it's performing, uh, that it's fetched, it stores its result, and then only after that, it becomes fetchable again. So that's, a, that's a beautiful way of designing the machine. Basically, your thread ID travels together with the instruction. As a result, you can ensure that you're not going to do anything with that thread until that thread's... Uh, you're, you're not going to fetch from that thread until that thread's thread ID gets back to the fetch queue. Okay. Okay. And this is another multi-thread pipeline example. Uh, actually, many multi-thread pipelines are like this. But of course, the cost is, this is, you can think of this as a queue, for example. But the cost is these queues now, right? You need to queue these threads. Uh, but you need to basically store program counters, thread IDs. Uh, you need to have multiple register files for different threads. So if you have 120 of them, you need to have 120 register files because you can switch between a th with different threads every cycle. Under 20, fetch contexts, program counter, thread ID. You need to have a thread selection logic. Could be round robin. GPUs actually have very sophisticated thread selection logics as we've discussed, right? You could actually do warp formation, for example. But GPUs are essentially very similar because GPUs have huge register files dedicated for each thread as well, right? So this is not that different from a GPU. <laughs> Okay, so this is, uh, but it's not necessarily specific to a GPU. It's really a multi-threaded pipeline uh, in the end, right? So if you look over here, this is one of the more recent machines that implemented fine-grained multi-threading. This is Sun Niagara. Uh, later, it became Oracle. Uh, but basically, it's a very, very simple pipeline. Uh, I think it's six cycles, and you can have four threads. Why four threads? Because the branches resolved at the end of the fourth cycle. As a result, you don't need to do branch prediction over here although you have more stages after the branches. But those stages don't matter because you don't need to detect data dependencies or control dependencies for the stages at the end of the pipeline, right? It's really the beginning of the pipeline that matters. So basically, this is, uh, they had four threads, four different program counters. This is the thread selection logic. And if you look over here, thread selection logic takes into account multiple different things. Normally, it's round robin, but if a thread has a resource conflict, it's not selected also, for example. If a thread is missed, it's not selected. Okay, I showed that. And there are instruction buffers to be able to fetch from four different threads. Which thread do you select? And there are four different register files for the four different threads over here. And they also have four different store buffers because threads are storing to different uh, locations. Okay, so let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages uh, of this approach. Clearly, there is no need for dependency checking between instructions. So all of those methods that we've discussed goes away, which is nice. Uh, only one instruction pipeline from a single thread. Or at least only one instruction in the pipeline stages that matter for dependency checking from a single thread. No need for branch prediction logic, and otherwise bubble cycles are used for executing useful instructions from different threads. So you improve system throughput, latency tolerance, and utilization. Everything comes hand in hand. Uh, this advantages clearly extra hardware complexity, right? Multiple hardware contexts, thread selection logic. You need to orchestrate this. And reduce single thread performance. This is not what you would design if you want single thread performance. And also you have resource contention between threads now. Before it was just one thread 
and the cache was for that thread, right? But now if you have 120 threads contending for the cache, you have the cache contention and memory contention problem. Your locality may suffer. The trade-off. And uh, this is also true. If the threads are not completely independent of each other, you still need to have some dependency checking logic. For example, if a thread is doing a store, another thread is doing a load, how do you ensure that the second thread that's doing a load that's dependent on the store doesn't get the wrong data? Right? So if the threads are synchronizing, for example, if one thread is writing to a lock and the other thread is reading from a lock, then you need to ensure in hardware that this logic still remains. And this is actually one of the more complicated parts of the hardware today. So you need to really ensure the threads are independent of each other. In a GPU, this is easy to do. But in the general case, it may not be that easy to do. OK. OK, so as I discussed, as, we, as you've seen, modern GPUs are actually fine-grained multi-threaded machines. Basically, they do fine-grained multi-threading across warps, right? A warp is a number of threads that is executed at the same program counter. Basically, they have the same program counter, and they execute in lockstep. Uh, a GPU fetches one warp. In the next cycle, it fetches from another warp. In the next cycle, it fetches from another warp, which means that it really fetches from another set of threads. So the granularity of fine-grained multi-threading is at the granularity of warps, not individual threads, just because of the execution model. The execution model says we're executing at the granularity of warps, right? And you've already seen this, so I'm not going to go through this in detail. But basically, uh, just to refresh your memory, you have groups of n threads, in this case n equals 32, share an instruction stream, each group is a warp, they execute the same instruction on different data, and in this particular processor, which is old, up to 32 warps are interleaved in a fine-grained multi-threaded manner. And you can have up to 1,024 thread contexts, and you have a lot of multi-threading basically as a result of this. And this is a beautiful picture of this, you have 30,000 threads in this GTX 285. In newer versions you have actually much more. Okay, that's the end of multi <laughs> fine-grained multi-threading. <laughs> that doesn't mean that it's not important. This is actually one of the most beautiful ideas, I think. Uh, of course, er like every other idea, it comes with a trade-off. Any questions on this? Otherwise, I think we should take a break for, let's say, seven minutes, and then we'll come back and continue. Okay, let's continue. Uh, handling control dependencies. We're almost at the end. So we'll cover another thing that's uh, been fascinating to many people also, and it's also used in modern processors in some shape or form, and that's called predicated execution. And the idea is to get rid of branches, basically, get rid of control flow of instructions. But before that, I will talk about predicate combining, which is not the same thing as predicate, predicated execution. Uh, this is an idea at a higher level at the software level. And I've already, I already discussed this yesterday a little bit, if you remember. Basically, if you have a complex predicates like this, you have a choice. You could convert it into multiple branches. For example, you could convert into three conditional branches, one testing this one, another testing this one, another testing this one, and you could do those tests sequentially, right? The problem is clearly, this increases the number of control dependencies and control flow instruction and things that you need to predict, dot, dot, dot. It causes all the problems that we've discussed. Uh, alternatively, you have a choice. You, have, you can combine these predicate operations and you can feed a single branch instruction instead of having one branch for each predicate. Right? So this is a predicate, this is another predicate, this is another predicate. If you combine them, you form a single predicate and you branch on that as opposed to having three branches. And how do you do that? Well, you could use general purpose registers for this, but you could also store and operate on these predicates using condition registers, which are supplied in some ISAs like PowerPC. And a single branch checks the value of the combined predicate. Right. You could do this with general purpose registers also. You don't need to have condition registers. Of course, the upside is you have fewer branches in code, hopefully fewer mispredictions and fewer stalls. Right. Fewer things to worry about in prediction. But the downside as you may also deduce from here, is you're possibly doing unnecessary work, right? So if you know C, which hopefully many of you do, uh, if you already know that this is not true, there's no need to compute any of this, right? 
But if you combine, a sing combine all of them to a single predicate, you're always computing all of those predicates uh, regardless of them because you're not even checking those, right? So basically, if the first predicate is false, there's no need to compute the other predicates. But if you're combining predicates, you have no choice. So that's the trade-off. And this is actually a very fundamental trade-off. We will see this in predicate execution as well. Whenever you get rid of branches, you're possibly doing unnecessary work in the code. Because the branch is there for a reason. <laughs> and we will see that in uh, predicate execution also. OK, so the condition registers that facilitate this register uh, exist in the power, IBM Power architecture. And IBM RS6000 was the first one that, to implement it, as far as I know. OK, this is not predicate execution, but it has some relation to it. Basically, you're really combining these predicates. OK, what is predicate execution? Basically, this is an ISA-level construct, really. Of course, like everything else, you could implement in hardware purely as well. We're not going to talk about that one. But the idea is very simple. Convert the control dependence into data dependence. Uh, and let me give you a simple example. Suppose we had a conditional move instruction. And based on some condition, you move register 2 into register 1. If that condition is not true, the operation is essentially a no-op. That's the semantics of the instruction. C move, based on the condition, move register 2 into register 1. So you probably know this construct also in C, right? In C, you can uh, express this as if the condition is true, R1 gets the value of R2. Otherwise, R1 gets the value of R1, which means that it doesn't change its value. Right? That's the semantics of the instruction. This is employed in most modern ISAs, x86 alpha arm dot dot dot. And let's give you, uh, let me give you an example with code bran uh, a code example with branches versus conditional moves. So this is one example with branches. If A is equal to 5, you set B to 4. Otherwise, you set B to 3. You could very simply write this with a comparison and two conditional moves. Comparison basically checks if A is equal to 5. Compare equal. And it sets this condition, which could be a register again, condition register. And... This conditional move, if the condition is true, moves 4 into B. If the con and this other conditional move moves 3 into B if the condition is false. Right. Now you've gotten rid of the branch. There's no branch here. There are only three instructions. Right. You've converted the branch into data dependency. Right. This is a data value. This is another data value supplied to these instructions. And these instructions execute based on that data dependency. Now, this has all the advantages of getting rid of the branches. It's straight-line code. You can fetch it. Uh, you can optimize the code. You can move around different things. You can reorder this, right? Uh, so it has, uh, and you don't need to predict the branches, clearly, because they don't exist anymore <laughs> over here. The downside is the fundamental trade-off. You, you are doing useless work. One of them is definitely useless, right? And you are definitely executing some useless thing over here. Now, if this was bigger, if you needed to do 100 things here and 100 things here, that useless work would be much larger. Right? So that's always the downside with predicate execution. You're doing useless work. So you need to do it very judiciously, carefully. OK, so a basic uh, idea again. Compiler converts control dependence into data dependence, which means that the branch is eliminated. Uh, how do you sub uh, accomplish this? Basically, you need to have support in the instruction set architecture. Each instruction is a predicate bit set based on the predicate computation. And only instructions with true predicates are committed. Others are turned into no ops. So of course, it depends on how you implement this in the ISA. This is conditional move. It has a different register, for example. But you could think of this as a predicate bit also, right? Basically, compare equal sets a predicate bit P1. And this takes into account P1 and not P1 over here. Basically, if the instruction is a true predicate, they're committed. Otherwise, uh, it's turned into an op. So let's take a look at some examples over here. This is, again, a very similar example. Uh, this is normal branch code over here. You branch on this uh, condition, the, this predicate, uh, either to a target or to a fall through. And you have actually two branches, one branch here, one unconditional branch here. Right? And this is the predicated code. It's straight line code now. You set the predicates and this instruction tests the not predicate. If the, if the not complement of the predicate is true, you move 1 to B. If the predicate is true, you move 0 to B. So you actually reduce the code size in this case. 
That's not always true. But in this case, you've gotten rid of the branches, which leads to reduced code size. Now, let's, let me introduce this one over here. You have, let's say, X, which I didn't show over here. It's part of D. Maybe we should have added it over here also. But basically, this, X, uh, uh, this add takes B and adds 1 to it. Now, this add is previously, uh, this add is data dependent on both of these now, right? This, because this, uh, this, uh, Mm. This, this, the, this, these instructions are data dependent on the predicate computation, and this add is data dependent on both of these because it needs to wait uh, both of these to resolve. Well, hopefully both of them will, will resolve at the same time. Now let's take a look at the differences between branch prediction and predication a little bit over here. So if you actually predicted this branch, if you predicted it correctly, you could execute this right away. Right? Whereas here, if you pre uh, you're not doing any prediction, you need to wait until that data dependency resolves to be able to execute this add. Of course, imagine now having 100 instructions here, 100 instructions there. You need to wait for a long time. Right? One instruction may not really show you the big picture, but if you have uh, bigger blocks over here, this becomes harder and more expensive to do. Okay. So if your branch prediction accuracy is really well, maybe that's not a good idea. <laughs> If you're almost always predicting the branch correctly, maybe that's not a good idea. Because you're always executing useless code over here, whereas if you're always predicting the branch correctly, you're never executing useless code. Right. On the other hand, this is harder to optimize because there are a lot of branches here, right? Whereas this is straight line code. As we discussed, compiler is more free to move code in the straight line code. So if you have larger blocks over here, 100, 100, 200, you can do code scheduling much more easily. Right. So that's another trade-off that this exposes. Straight line code is always easier to optimize because you don't have branches. You don't have those safety problems that we've discussed earlier. OK. So uh, I will refer to multiple papers, but this is the first seminal paper that introduced the idea of uh, predicate execution. They called it if conversion. It's a compiler uh, technique. And the reason they actually wanted to do this was not because of branches. Well, they wanted to eliminate branches, but not because of pipelining reasons. The reason is they wanted to parallelize the code. So they figured out that if you have a branch in the middle of a loop that you could otherwise parallelize, you don't know how to parallelize it. So get rid of the branch, and now you can actually have a wide vector instruction that you can have. OK, you can read that paper. That's beautiful. And we'll talk about this also. That's a more recent work. OK, we've already talked about the conditional move operations. But the conditional move operations are actually a very limited form of predicated execution. Right. OK, so let's take a look at why predicated execution can be interesting in modern machines. Uh, it can be high performance and energy efficient, assuming it you, if you use it judiciously. So this is predicated execution. Basically, you uh, form, turn this into straight line code, A, B, C, D, E, E, F. And you fetch all of them. And after you execute the branch, the predicate, the branch doesn't exist, one of these become a no-op. You fill the pipeline with a lot of useful instructions. Now, if you do branch prediction, if you fetch the wrong thing, and if you don't fetch the right thing, you need to flush the entire pipeline. Right? So if you do it at the right times, this can be very energy efficient because you're just you're minimizing the useless work, in a sense. Whereas there's a lot of useless work here if you mispredicted the branch. Right. So that's the idea. OK, so basically, you, you can eliminate branches. You enable straight line code, larger basic blocks in code. Let's look at the advantages of this. Well, I think uh, you can eliminate hard to predict branches. That's where this becomes really interesting. Of course, how do you decide what's hard to predict? How does the compiler decide what's hard to predict? We'll see. Disadvantages, well, unfortunately, this reordered itself. <laughs> OK, uh, always not taken prediction works better, of course, right? Because there are no branches. That may or may not be interesting. But more interestingly, the compiler has more freedom to optimize the code. There are no branches in the code now. There are data dependencies it needs to obey, but no branches. So control flow doesn't hinder instruction reordering. 
So you don't need to form a super block, you just form a huge predicated code block. Uh, code optimizations are hindered only by data dependencies. So disadvantages, as always, useless work. Some instructions are fetched and executed, but not discarded. And this is especially bad for easy to predict branches. You could have easily avoided that useless work. And it requires additional ISA and hardware support. And we will see some of that hardware and ISA support. And the other question exists, can we eliminate all branches this way? What do you guys think? Can you get rid of all of the branches in the code? Yes? You're a bold man. <laughs> okay, unroll everything. <laughs> okay, now, yeah, yes, you, you've specified it well. How do you know how much to unroll a loop with unknown bounds? <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> Yes, I think you, uh, you figured it out, basically. Yes, if, uh, so the answer is yes, if you can unroll all the loops and get rid of loop branches, but it's very difficult to eliminate a loop branch. <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't know the bounds of the loop, how many times you're going to iterate, it's very, very difficult. If you come up with a way, maybe you'll win the Turing Award. <laughs> okay, basically, loop branches are very hard to eliminate this way. They're backward branches. Actually, in the original paper, they call it backward branches also in the if conversion paper, and they say we cannot eliminate these. And there's not much to be done over there, I think. Okay. Let's look at the branch prediction versus predicate execution trade-off. So predicate execution eliminates mispredictions for hard-to-predict branches. So there's no need for branch prediction for those hard-to-predict branches. This is another way of getting rid of those hard-to-predict branches. This is good, but there is another trade-off. This is good if the misprediction cost is greater than useless work due to predication. So it's not as simple, right? You're doing still some useless work, uh, but if your misprediction cost is higher than that, maybe this is good. The problem is it causes useless work for branches that are easy to predict. So it reduces performance if the misprediction cost is less than useless work. Uh, one of the problems with predicate execution, at least at the ISA level, if the compiler does it, it's not adaptive. And as we've seen with branch prediction, branch behavior is very dynamic, right? It changes very, very quickly. Uh, so runtime behavior changes based on input sets, based on program phase, based on control flow path, that type taken, not taken, taken, not taken. Well, that's easy to predict. But you can have hard to predict patterns also that change very dynamically. So this has been a big problem in predication. As a result, it has not bought a lot of performance gains uh, in terms of the branch benefit. It's both performance gains in terms of compiler optimization. Actually, there's a beautiful paper uh, that was written by Intel, I think in micro 2003 or 1. Uh, somebody needs to find this and put it on the web. Uh, Alan Knees is one of the co-authors. Uh, co but basically, they analyzed the benefit of if conversion, predicated execution in Itanium, Intel Itanium, IA64, which many of you may or may not know. How many of you know IA64, Itanium? Well, you guys are a different generation, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> if I asked this question 10 years ago, people would know about Itanium. So that was Intel's attempt to uh, move to 64-bit architecture. What they said was, we have this x86, it's a huge kludge. While we're moving to 64-bit architecture, let's redesign the entire instruction set ISA. And they came up with IA64, which is completely different from x86, which has a lot of very good ideas. But from a business perspective, that may not have been a good choice, and that has proved to not have been a good choice, actually. Because basically, instead of adding 64-bit support uh, to x86, they completely redesigned a new ISA. And Itanium is the first microarchitecture that actually implemented IA64, and it had predication in it. And the reason it had predication in it was because this I, the, the philosophy of this ISA was exposed a lot to the software such that the software can do a lot of code optimization, which is a good philosophy. But then uh, uh, AMD came up with the 64-bit ISA, which is essentially an increment over x86. Like they called it x86-64, and Intel had to go by with x86-64 because everybody in the world liked x86-64 because they didn't need to change their code. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> Itanium is essentially that attempt uh, by Intel to change the ISA significantly which had predicated execution. And the paper that I uh, mentioned that led to this discussion 
analyzes the effects of predicate execution on Itanium programs, and it shows that the performance benefit they get is about 2% by using predication. Now, it's not clear if this is because predicate execution was implemented well or not well in the microarchitecture, or maybe they did good optimizations or bad optimizations, but that's what they said. Uh, that was their benefit. But I believe one of the reasons is really the fact that it's very difficult to adapt uh, uh, predication, compile time predication to the behavior of the branches dynamically. As a result, you produce this code that's static. You have to be either very, very careful and conservative, such that you don't introduce all of this useless work, or you, if, you're, if you're aggressive, your program needs to be really representative of what's going on. Even if it's representative, you introduce useless, useless work, right? So there's a problem. So the benefits you gain from this must be really large. Uh, okay, so this is one example. This is predicate execution. I, uh, we, we're going to get back to this, actually. I'm going to talk about wish branches that tries to fix that problem. Okay, so in Intel Itanium, each instruction can be separately predicated. You have 64 one-bit predicate registers, and each instruction carries a six-bit predicate field, which enlarges your instruction. That's one problem potentially, right? An instruction is effectively a no-op if its predicate is false. So this is one example of code when you compile it into uh, Itanium code, right? It looks pretty simple. So of course, uh, if you want to have complicated control flow graphs, and if you want to have straight line code out of them, now you need to combine predicates, right? So you actually need to do operations on predicates, and that actually adds some overhead. Uh, I don't show it over here, but uh, you can imagine that. So if, if your com control flow graph becomes really complex, predicate execution becomes harder and harder to manage, both at the compiler level uh, as well as in terms of the useless work that you have. Yeah, yeah, they were supporting branch prediction also. So because predicate execution cannot eliminate all of the branches, right? So they, and, and not all of the branches you want to predicate also, get rid of uh, all of the branches because some of them are easy to predict. Okay, so ARM, uh, ARM actually made the choice of getting rid of predicate execution <laughs> in their version 8. But before that, my lectures were up to date, and I was nicely talking about ARM. I say as an example of uh, introducing, uh, using conditional execution. But basically, prior to ARM v8, almost all ARM instructions included an optional condition code. An instruction with a condition code is executed only if the condition code flags meet the spec specified condition. That's essentially predicated execution. It's called conditional execution, but that's the conditional code. So they got rid of it such that uh, they could better utilize the instruction set, uh, in my opinion. Maybe that was a good choice for them. They still have uh, conditional moves. Uh, but let me go through this regardless, because they have these nice slides that explained how you could do predicate ex execution in ARM uh, before version 8. But you can see, basically, these are the conditions under which an instruction is executed. If you set the condition bits to zero, the instruction is executed only if the zero condition code is set. Somebody, some other instruction sets the zero condition code, and the instruction is executed if that's set. Uh, and you can actually go through this, basically. It has different meanings, for example. For example, this instruction is executed only if the overflow bit is set. An overflow bit is set by some other instruction, let's say an add instruction overflowed. You could actually uh, have a conditional instruction that checks that bit using this condition bits implicitly, and does something based on that overflow condition, right? If that overflow condition is true, you do something, right? And so it's actually very powerful. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Basically, to execute an instruction conditionally, you simply postfix this with the appropriate condition. So that's the condition over here. And you execute this only if the zero flag is set. So add EQ, EQ means you execute the instruction only if the zero flag is set. And they also say, by default, data processing operations do not affect the condition flags. To cause the condition flags to be updated, the S bit of the instruction needs to be set by postfixing the instruction. Of course, this is an assembler primitive. Basically, this sets the flags, right? And if R0 is 0, it sets the 0 flag. If the computation results in a 0, it sets the 0 flag. And the next instruction that's dependent on it can check the 0 flag. That's the idea. So they have this beautiful example, which is the greatest common denominator algorithm which hopefully performs greatest common denominator com computation over here. I think it does. Uh, and basically, they show a code example uh, 
Basically, it's, it's checking if R0 is equal to 1. If not, it checks if R0 is greater than 1. It starts subtracting uh, R0, uh, R1 from R0 such that you could get to the greatest common denominator. Otherwise, it does the other way, subtraction, starts subtracting uh, R0 from R1. And eventually, you get uh, uh, to an inequality uh, over here. Okay, anyway, you can, you can go through the code. But this is the normal code that you would write without predicated execution. It's basically this code converted to branches, which is easy. And this is the code that you would get with predicated execution. Simply, you compare R0 to R1, this case. You check uh, if, if, if the result is greater than, meaning R0 is greater than R1, you subtract R1 from R0, well, the other way around. I don't know how they set the flags, but yeah, <laughs> that's the idea. If the result is less than, otherwise, you subtract R0 from R1. And this is the branch that you cannot eliminate with predicate execution because you don't have the bounds, right? That's the case in this case. You don't, you don't know the branch bounds. That's why that branch exists. You still need the branch to go, to go to the beginning. But this is much more compact code, as you can see, and this is similar to what we've seen before. Okay, so let's talk about idealism a little bit. Uh, we've seen the downsides of this, but wouldn't it be nice, actually, if the branch is eliminated only when it would actually be mispredicted? That would be nice, I think. And that was one of our goals when we start look, looked at predication. So if the branch were predicted on, uh, when, when it would actually be correctly predicted. So you actually want the best of both worlds, right? And idealism always <laughs> starts from wanting the best of both worlds. Now, I'm going to assume that uh, here, uh, we're going to assume that the benefits, uh, there, there's, there's another benefit to predicate execution, which is really the code layout and uh, the straight line code you get. You may not be able to get all of that uh, if, if, if you're posing the problem this way, and we'll see that. So basically, if the branch is hard to predict, we want predication. If the branch is easy to predict, we want branch prediction. And also, it wouldn't be nice if the predication didn't require ISA support uh, and some other things. Basically, uh, we, uh, improving predicate execution, there are three major limitations. One is adaptivity, as we've discussed. The other is ISA support, as we've also discussed. And the third one, or the second one in this case, is a complex control flow graph. If you have a really complex control flow graph, you need to manage the predicates. And uh, this becomes basically wasted work increases. And also the probability of wasted work also increases. It's, it's very difficult to manage for the compiler. And also decide whether you want, to uh, you want to actually predicate. So this is one example of a complex control flow graph, for example. It's actually nice because it has a final merge point. So you could actually predicate everything in between. But what if you don't have a merge point? That what if you have something that flies over here, and then you have another control flow graph over here? How do you predicate then? Well, if you want to do that, now you need to form a super block and do that optimization, do predication inside the super block. And that turns out it's called a hyper block in compiler terminology. A hyper block is a super block with internal branches predicated. OK, anyway, we don't need to go into that. But basically, I'll, to, I'll tell you this idea because it's a very nice idea, I think. I won't tell you this idea. It's a more complex idea. Basically, which branches try to solve the adaptivity problem? If the branch is hard to predict, we're going to use branch prediction. If the branch is easy to predict, if the branch is hard to predict, we're going to use predication. If the branch is easy to predict, we're going to use branch prediction. And I'm not going to talk about how it solves the loops. Basically, it's inapplicable to loops, but you can actually get some of the benefits in the loops. This diverge merge processor actually tries to solve all of the problems. It, it tries to get rid of the ISA overhead. And the idea is basically simply push the predication support into the hardware. The idea over here, very briefly, the compiler marks where you can merge. So when you get to this branch, you know that the merge point is over here. And hardware dynamically starts predicating the code. So it dynamically inserts instructions that have predicate bits. And it dynamically sets the conditions. You could do that, right? Anything you could do in software, you could do in hardware also, except merge point is very, very hard to do. Why? Because you need to know the future somehow, right? Actually, that requires very complicated control flow graph analysis. You could do it in hardware also, but it's very expensive because you need to see the code once and you need to see all of the paths once. What if you haven't seen a path that hasn't merged yet or that it will never merge? So it's very hard to prove at the hardware level. That's why we, uh, it's, it's, it's better to mark the merge point. When you get to this branch, you have a marker saying, oh, 
I have uh, this branch can be predicated, and I have a marker to the merge point, which is this program counter over here. And you can predicate safely until you reach that merge point, because I can guarantee that you're going to meet, re, uh, reach that merge point. If you do that now, the hardware can predicate dynamically. I'm not going to tell you how it does. You can read the paper over here. OK, but I'm going to tell you the wish branches idea. Uh, it's called wish branches because you wish the branches were executed in some way. <laughs> uh, that is good. Basically, the idea is simple. The compiler generates code that can be executed either as predicated code or non-predicated code. Uh, and uh, the idea of wish branches is to enable this. And the hardware decides to execute predicated or, uh, code or normal branch code at runtime based on the confidence of branch prediction. Remember the confidence? We're going to make use of it now. So easy to predict, normal branch code, hard to predict, predicated code. Now let's take a look at how this works. Uh, basically, you have this code. This is normal branch. This is predicated code. We're going to generate something that looks like this. Basically, it's a beast that combines both of them. <laughs> but the branches have a special meaning now. You have this wish jump over here, and you have a wish join over here, as opposed to these. OK, let's see how this is executed now. So let's assume we get to this branch. It's high confidence. Right? So you predict it, and you want to execute it as normal branch code. So it's predicted taken. What you do is you set the predicate to 1 immediately, and you execute. That's it. <laughs> Done, right? Basically, you don't care about the predicate. If you're executing the code at high confidence, you predict the branch, and you set the predicate accordingly. You don't wait for the predicate because you're predicting the branch. OK. And if it's predicted to be not taken, it's the same thing. This predicate is set, and that, is, that becomes an unconditional branch now. OK? So if this is low confidence, it's supposed to be executed this way. So you get to this branch. The confidence estimator tells you that this is low confidence. So you should really predicate the code. Well, it's already predicated, so you keep fetching sequentially. And you wait for the predicates to resolve. And when the, when, when, when the predicate resolves, one of these blocks will be no op. That's the idea. So by having the code that's capable of executing both, hopefully you get the best of both worlds. Of course, you lose out on the benefits of sequential code because you still have branches here. You may have special branches, but they're branches. So it's not straight line code anymore. OK, compared to predicate execution, now you have reduced the overhead of predication because now you have a dynamic choice, right? You could do this on a per branch, per dynamic instance of a branch basis. And it turns out, actually, if you read the paper, you can increase the benefit of predicated code by allowing the compiler to generate more aggressively predicated code because you could avoid it at runtime. Right. And uh, now your predicate code is less dependent on machine configuration. Actually, uh, that was one of the issues with the machines that were designed with predicate code. This, is, uh, this implicitly ties the compiler to a particular implementation, right? Because if your branch predictor is great, maybe your compiler doesn't generate a lot of predicated code, right? But if your branch predictor is very poor, your compiler generates a lot of predicated code. Now, if in one generation, you improve the branch prediction accuracy a lot. The old code that you optimized for the previous generation with a bad branch predictor may run actually much worse on this new generation where you actually have a really good branch predictor. Right? So you always have that machine dependence problem. If the code that you generate is dependent on some hardware uh, structure that gets improved or that, get, that, get, that gets changed over time. It's not the same thing as delayed branching. This is, this is a more subtle, right? It's really dependent on the performance of some hardware, right? Your compiler is optimizing, based, assuming some performance. OK, there are clearly disadvantages compared to predicate execution also. Now you have extra branch instructions, right? Predicate execution eliminates those. Extra branch instructions increase contention for the branch predictor table. You, basically, you don't get the benefits uh, from reducing the contention on the branch predictor table because you still need to predict them. Or at least you, you still need to. Uh, figure out somehow, do confidence estimation on these. And clearly, we constrain the compiler scope for code optimizations by getting rid of the sequential nature of uh, predicated code. OK, any questions? Cool. OK, let's move on to the last one, uh, last but not least. So multipath execution is another idea. 
This was actually uh, first proposed by this paper, which is relatively theoretical. Uh, the idea is very simple. You execute both paths after a conditional branch. And this paper, when it proposed it, it proposed doing it for every branch, which may not be a good idea, assuming they're easy to predict. But they basically improve the parallelism. Again, the goal was o over here was to improve parallelism. Uh, the, uh, for hard to, uh, so um, I'm going to modify it by talking about the hard-to-predict branch by using dynamic confidence estimation. So for example, you can say, uh, oh, this branch is hard to predict, so I'm going to follow both paths. This next branch that I encounter is not hard to predict, so I'm not going to follow both paths. I'm going to use branch prediction. That's a better idea. Uh, so it improves performance if the misprediction cost is, again, greater than useless work. Clearly, you're doing useless work here if you're following both paths. And there's no ISA change needed in this case, but you do need some hardware cost. You need to distinguish between multiple paths, right? Actually, it's, it's very much like different contexts because you have different sets of registers for this path versus for that path, right? And in fact, if, you're, if, you, if you keep going down many, many branches, you may have many, many sets of registers. Okay, disadvantages, I just told you actually, what happens when the machine encounters another hard to predict branch? You execute both paths again. Now you're increasing your paths exponentially. Paths followed can quickly become exponential if you have a lot of hard to predict branches. Each followed path requires its own context, registers, program counter, in fact, even branch prediction context. Otherwise, you may not be predicting branches correctly on that path, right? Uh, and wasted work, clearly. If, and wasted work, if, especially if paths merge. If they don't merge, you still have wasted work, but maybe you can overcome it because you, otherwise you may have mispredicted it. But if the path starts merging, you still keep following both paths, right? unless you have uh, an intelligent mechanism. So this, this is, let's look at dual path execution. You follow only two paths. So you can restrict this by saying, I follow only two paths, and I'm not going to create new paths. Uh, so this is hard to predict. Dual path execution basically starts two paths and follows it. Clearly, there's some wasted work, even though instructions may be a little bit different because the data dependencies are different over here. Independent instructions are executed multiple times in this case, right? Whereas predicate execution does this, right? This is an example of dynamic predication, but static predication, you can think of it that way also. Right? So the reason you cannot merge these paths is it becomes very hard to figure out what's, where to merge. <laughs> and merging adds complexity also. So it's possible, actually, you can merge these paths based on what I discussed earlier, if the compiler marks the control flow merge points. But you need to know that merge point. OK. Any questions? So this, uh, uh, this dual path execution was used in IBM RS6000, I believe. Uh, but not, not as a true dual path execution, but to reduce the branch misprediction penalty. So they, were, they, they fetched. When they fetched from the correct path, they also fetched from, well, predicted path, they also fetched from the not predicted path. So if the branch was mispredicted, they would actually quickly supply instructions that they already fetched from the mispredicted, uh, from, from the path uh, that they didn't predict. I don't know of any machine that had actually employed it in full blown because it adds a lot of complexity into the machine. Okay. Let's see, we still have some time. So I'll cover uh, handling other types of branches. So we've concerned ourselves a lot with conditional branches, but other types of branches exist. If you remember this picture that I've shown you when, I, when we started this branch prediction lecture yesterday, there are these other types of branches. Unconditional branches are not that interesting, clearly. Uh, but these are uh, harder branches, as you can see. Return addresses, for example. There are many potential targets you can take because these are register indirect. And also indirect branches that are not necessarily returns are even more general. They may have many, many targets. How do we predict those targets? Here, you're, you're, you, it, they're always taken clearly. They're unconditional, but their targets vary. OK, that's the question. So let's look at call and return prediction because this is relatively easy, assuming your program is well behaved. Uh, so if you have direct calls, that look like this, uh, they're always taken and they have a single target, right? Because you do a call to a particular function and you know the target address of that function or the starting address of that function. 
So it's easy to predict those. You mark the call in the BTB, and the target is predicted by the BTB. That's it. Right. There's no direction prediction that's needed. But returns that may or may not correspond to those calls are indirect branches. Let's assume that they correspond to calls like this. So you do a call, and this is the corresponding return. And you do a call, and this is the corresponding return. And you do another call, that's the corresponding return. So these are nested calls, as you can see. And the returns match the nesting level of the calls that, they, that generated that. Returns are indirect branches, and a function can be called from many points in code. As a result, a return instruction can have many, many target addresses. Next instruction after each call point uh, for the same function. That's the target address of the return, right? So the target address of this return is the instruction that's right here. The target address of this return is the instruction that's right here. The target address of this return is the instruction that's right here. I mean, in sequential code. So the observation is that usually a return matches a call. This doesn't always be, have to be the case. But assuming programs are well behaved, they look like this. You do nested calls, and you have nested corresponding returns. And many processors, actually all processors that I know of, use what is called a return address stack to predict these return addresses. What they do is, when, you, when they fetch a call, they push the return address onto the stack. Return address is the address of the next instruction after the call. When you fetch the return, you pop the stack and use the address as its predicted target. This is beautiful. It works under two conditions, well-behaved, and the stack doesn't overflow. <laughs> Once you start overflowing, <laughs> you have a problem, right? So it, it turns out with an eight-entry stack and with reasonable programs, you get 95% accuracy. And uh, the inaccuracies are because programs may sometimes have non-matching calls and returns. That may happen. Go to, maybe one thing, for example. Those things are <laughs> interesting uh, examples. Or set jump and long jump uh, in C, if you've ever used them. I don't recommend using them. But <laughs> anyway, uh, if your stack overflows, then you have another problem. Uh, even though these may be perfectly fine, your call depth may be larger than your stack. Uh, and this may be actually something interesting to think about when you're programming. You, don't, you, may, want, you may not want a lo very large call depth that overwhelms the stack of the processor. OK. OK, there are, there are really interesting issues over here I, do, I won't get into. Uh, because this return address stack, now you have branches also. When you actually have a branch misprediction, if you want to be able to correctly predict returns after that, you need to recover the return address stack also. You don't need to recover. Basically, if you have a branch misprediction, you flush the pipeline. Uh, you've already pushed stuff onto your return address stack. So you need to go back to a point uh, where uh, that reflects the return address stack at the time you fetch that branch that you mispredicted. This actually makes a big difference in terms of performance. If you actually uh, do not recover the return address stack when you have a misprediction, your performance can reduce because now you start mispredicting all of the returns that you have. So there are really subtle things that you need to know when you design uh, a processor how to handle a misprediction. You need to recover the return address stack. You need, to recover, uh, you need to clearly recover the architectural state so that you execute correctly. But you need to recover these prediction structures to get higher performance. Global history register you need to recover. Local history registers, how do you recover them? That's always a question because there are many, many local history registers. OK. OK, let's look at the more general indirect branches. So register indirect branches have multiple targets. This is a conditional branch. It's direct, and it has two targets only. That's maybe easy. But this is a bit harder, right? You're branching on a value that loads from memory. How do you predict this thing? And these are used to implement many, many things, like switch case statements. You don't want to have many, many conditional branches going through all of the conditions. Uh, virtual function calls, jump tables of function pointers, interface calls, many, many things are use indirect branches today. Uh, Let's look at how it's handled. First of all, there is no need for direction prediction. That's good. Uh, one idea is predict the last result target address as the next fetch address. This is last time, last target prediction for a given indirect branch. And you already have the last target. You can put that into the BTB. And it's simple. This is a simple approach. You, you can use the BTB to store and predict the target address. The downside is it's actually very inaccurate. Empirically, it's about 50% accurate. In fact, in modern code with, that uses a lot of these things, 
like virtual function calls, interface calls, dot, dot, dot. There are a lot more indirect branches, so this is reducing over time. Many indirect branches actually switch between different targets. So people have proposed other ideas. One idea is history-based target prediction based on where you come uh, to execute this branch or which branches you've executed to come to this indirect branch. You take a particular target, and it turns out this works better. You can index the BTB with global history register XORed with the indirect branch PC, for example. And that's proposed in this paper. And it's much better, more accurate. Now, the downside is an indirect branch may map to too many entries in the branch target buffer. Right? And you cause interference. You may cause conflict misses with other branches. So you can actually reduce your conditional branch prediction accuracy by increasing your indirect branch prediction accuracy. So a lot of processors actually have a separate indirect branch target buffer to ensure that they don't reduce the conditional branch prediction accuracy while they're doing this prediction. So now we have two in branch target buffers. Uh, okay, and also you, have, you may actually inefficiently use the space if the branch has few target addresses. You don't necessarily want, so if the branch has one target address, you don't really want the XORing, right? <laughs> because XORing, uh, well, I guess it's fine in this case because you XOR the same thing. Uh, no, no, you don't, you don't want XORing with the global history register because you have a one target address regardless of the history. If you actually do this XORing, it's not necessarily good because you, you need to store the same address in many, many places in the BTB. And many, many places are caused by this global history register, because you come to that branch with many, many global histories, probably. <clears throat> okay. So as I discussed earlier, uh, this is implemented in many processors. AMD has it. Intel has its own version. This is the level of detail Intel provides over here. <laughs> But basically, that's, the in, that's their indirect branch predictor logic. They take into account global history as well as the instruction pointer uh, in their design. And you can read form in, uh, more in this paper. But basically, they have a separate indirect branch target buffer. OK, there are more ideas on indirect branches. I'm going to cover one of them because I find it very clever. Uh, but I'm not going to go more into detail. This is actually an area that requires more work, I think, especially with the increasing indirect branches. I'm going to co cover one thing. Uh, the idea basically is very simple, actually. Uh, it's to dynamically devirtualize the branch. <laughs> so if you, if you think about an indirect branch, it's not clear when you really need an indirect branch. Maybe returns are an example. But if you're, for example, implementing a case statement, you could always make, turn that into multiple conditional branches. Right? It's really a sequence of conditional branches. And the idea is to do that in hardware use the conditional branch prediction structures iteratively to make an indirect branch prediction. Basically, devirtualize the indirect branch in hardware. So if you're curious, you can read that paper. But I'll give you the idea very quickly, because you actually know uh, all of the structures that are involved in it. Uh, to treat an indirect branch as multiple virtual conditional branches in hardware only for prediction purposes, and predict each virtual conditional branch iteratively. So let's assume that you have this things that you can XOR uh, a value with, and you have this program counter, and this is the program counter of the indirect branch that you're trying to predict. You take this program counter, you hash it with a value, and index, you, you form a virtual program counter. And that virtual program counter is used to index your branch prediction structure. And you do this iteratively multiple times. So, okay, let's go back here. So this is your real instruction. Let's say this is an indirect call. It's basically really calling into R1. Uh, you can imagine this as a sequence of conditional jumps, right? Conditional jump to target one, target two, target three. Think of this as a switch case statement, right? You're switching on a value, and if the value is equal to E, you're jumping to some place doing something. If the value is equal to F, you're jumping to some other place to do something else. If the value is equal to G, you're jumping to some other place. If the value is equal to H, you're jumping to some other place. That's essentially a switch case statement expressed as a number of conditional jumps. The programmer could have done it, except that would have taken a lot of code. But they decided instead to use an indirect call. But the hardware is imagining <laughs> that this is a sequence of conditional jumps. So what it's trying to do, what we're going to try to do is take the program counter. In the first iteration, we're going to emulate this jump just for prediction purposes. 
You take the program counter, you assume some global history register for now, and XOR it with the global history register, that's a G-share predictor that you know, and you get a direction prediction, and you also get a target address. Now, if the branch direction prediction says not taken, you go to the next branch. Make sense? Basically, we're converting this indirect branch to a sequence of conditional branches iteratively. First iteration, this one. The direction prediction says not taken, so we're going to predict the next branch, next iteration. So to predict the next branch, you need to ensure that you don't index into the same target, because these branches are supposed to have different targets, right? You need to basically create another location where you can store the t target of that branch. And how do you do that? Well, this is where this value uh, comes. Basically, second iteration, you take L, which is the program counter, and hash it with this known value, and you generate a virtual PC. That's the virtual program counter. And you also shift in the prediction that you made for this branch in the virtual global history register. Now you can actually have a prediction, direction prediction for this branch you're imagining. And you have actually another place where you store it in the branch target buffer. Now if this says not taken, you're going to go to the next branch. Ignore the target. So next iteration, very similar. You generate another virtual program counter. You shift in the global history register with these imagined branches. And now it says taken, then use the target. So you could keep doing this forever, right? <laughs> That's the idea. What this enables is it emulates this indirect branch to be predicted with conditional branch uh, structures that we know. You just need to ensure that for each of the emulated conditional branch instructions, you have a separate place to store the target in the BTB. You need to ensure that you keep track of the history that you have, and you need to ensure that uh, you also have a different pattern history table entry for that, right? That's the idea. Okay, so you predict the target as target three. And it turns out this is actually quite accurate. Well, I guess I gave you everything over here. This achieves very high prediction accuracy, about 90%, more than 90% in many cases. There's no need for a separate indirect branch predictor. Uh, it's resource efficient because of that. And one of the benefits uh, of things like this is improvement in conditional branch prediction algorithms actually also improves indirect branch prediction if you actually use something like this. And the number of locations in the BTB consumed for a branch is number of target addresses that are seen. So remember, if you actually take global history register and extort with program counter, you actually create a lot of locations in the branch target buffer because you may, have, you may have a single target all the time but many, many different histories. You don't want that. In this case, you only store a target address if you've seen it. So, for example, if the branch has only one target, this is always done in the first iteration. Until, uh, of course, if, when, uh, when you get warmed up. Right? You never go to the next iteration, so you store only one address. If the branch has two targets, it's always done in two iterations. Three targets and three iterations, dot, dot, dot. At most three iterations. Okay. So this advantage, of course, it's iterative, right? It takes multiple cycles to predict the target address. Uh, and also, whenever you combine different stuff, different branch instructions in the same predictor, you always have interference in the direction predictor and the BTB. So this is actually an interesting idea. Uh, it's not implemented, as far as I know, in any processor. But software versions actually implement it uh, in... Uh, in uh, in, in some compilers, it's called devirtualization. Uh, it's interesting because people generate indirect branches and the software goes and converts them back into conditional branches. And the reason they do it is they figure out that you don't need that indirect branch because dynamically uh, the program has only one target address or two target addresses. So Java actually, a lot of Java compilers used to do this. I don't know if they still do it. I assume they still do it. Uh, but basically, uh, when they actually profiled the code, they would figure out the hot code portions, and they would figure out which branches were taken to where. As a result, they would know whether an indirect branch has one target or two targets. And if, it, if it has, let's say, two targets, it would convert the indirect branch to two consecutive conditional branches, and it would basically say, and it would also know which target is more likely. It would test, the, it, it would basically put the first branch 
that's more frequently taken as the first conditional branch and the second branch uh, that's less frequently taken as the second conditional branch. So it's really a software technique that's devirtualizing a virtual function call. The reason it's called devirtualization is indirect branches are used to implement virtual function calls in object-oriented languages because whenever you have an object-oriented language, you do a virtual function call. Uh, let's say the object is a shape. A shape could be a circle, square, I know, an ellipse. Uh, so you have three different objects. Uh, so you really need to first figure out what is the object type and then uh, b branch based on that. So you could implement this as three conditional branches, assuming you have three maximum objects. Or you could implement this as an indirect branch going through a virtual function table. Uh, usually it's implemented as an indirect branch going through a virtual function table. That, that's a choice for the compiler also. Uh, but for example, statically, uh, you may figure out that there may be 1,000 objects. But dynamically, there's only one type of object that you call this function on, circle. That's a good time when you want to devirtualize the function call and turn, turn the indirect branch to a conditional branch. And the reason you want to turn the indirect branches to conditional branches is because, again, indirect branches are hard to predict. Right? That's the reason they have this optimization. Also, indirect branches are hard to optimize the code with as well, actually. That, that's something we didn't talk about, but you have many targets. It's harder to optimize the code. If you have, if you have, at least, if you have two targets, at least you know where to move the uh, code from, right? Dynamically, you can optimize the code much, dynamically or statically, you can optimize the code much more easily if you have only two targets. Okay, any questions? Yes? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's a very good question. So basically, uh, if you remember, when I talked about the alpha 21 to 64, the tournament branch predictor, there was a line over there that said they flush the branch prediction structures on a context switch. People have examined that and they figured out uh, mixed <laughs> results. But they, I think overall flushing is better. Uh, but it depends, I think. If you, if you can... Yeah. Yeah, you, I mean, if you swap the page tables, you automatically flush the cache, right? Yes, uh, that's right. Uh, I think with branch prediction, uh, it's, it, you don't have to. First of all, it's not a correctness problem, right? Because you're just predicting branches, so you don't have to do anything at all, which is the beautiful part. <laughs> but you may get bad performance, of course, if you don't do anything. Uh, so certainly flushing the return address stack, for example, is important because that's <laughs> that, that has things that are... Actually, there's the other question also, right? When you bring in a process, what do you do, right? You need to warm up all of the structures again, right? But usually flushing is good uh, because the, the program that you're running doesn't have anything to do with this program, right? All of the histories that you've accumulated doesn't affect. <laughs> That's true, yes, exactly, that's true. So you could potentially make this part of the context and reload it and things like that, but that's a lot of overhead. Yeah, no, uh, no, no system that I know of does that reloading part. Usually systems flush the structures when, when a process starts. That's a very good question, though. <laughs> okay, so let's keep going a little bit more. Uh, I'm not going to cover uh, everything, uh, and I'll leave you... Uh, I'll let you guys leave early this time, but I'll cover two issues in uh, branch prediction very quickly. I mean, we've already discussed this. You need to identify a branch before it's fetched. How do we do this? We've already discussed this also. You can have a BTB hit, and BTB entry contains the type of the branch, right? Not just whether it's a branch, but also type of the branch. Or, as we discussed also, you can have pre-decoded branch type information stored in the instruction cache, right? And the instruction cache is essentially where your BTB is, if that's the case. But if you don't have a BTB, I don't think I would recommend this, but this, this exists also. Essentially, you have a bubble in the pipeline until the target address is computed. And IBM Power4 actually had this. I think they fixed it in future IBM Powers. Uh, but basically, uh, they had a single bubble every time you have a branch. Take them, take a branch. <laughs> okay. Uh, one last issue. Uh, well, almost last issue. Uh, prediction latency is critical, actually, and uh, if you haven't realized that, we made a MUX very large. Uh, 
basically you need to generate the next fetch address for the next cycle. Bigger, more complex predictors are more accurate, but they're slower. And you need to determine the next fetch address, right? And it comes from many places. And actually, there are more over here. Line and weight prediction is another one, for example. That's the reason why we have line and weight prediction such that, because some of these may be very hard to get. Uh, okay. Because, uh, well, not, not some of these, but the question mark may be very hard to get, right? Like, which one do you choose? Clearly, uh, for a conditional branch, uh, you need the target from the BTB, but your critical path actually goes through this part which is your complicated branch predictor <laughs> over here, right? So you need to ensure that that complicated branch predictor doesn't really increase your latency so much that it destroys your critical path. Uh, you need to make the right trade-off, basically. And the alpha designers made the trade-off of predicting the line and way, as we've discussed. Okay, I don't think I'm going to cover this. I'll leave these slides with you, but there are more slides. Uh, but I can take some more questions if you have questions right now. We're done with control flow handling for now. Any questions, thoughts? Any new ideas? <laughs> you can always say, oh, this is a terrible idea. I have my new idea. <laughs> Good to be bold. I like the fact that you were trying to eliminate the, all of the branches, for example. It would be great, I agree, if you can come up with a way. <laughs> Machine learning is a solution to everything, huh? <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Although, as I said, machine learning is the, uh, branch prediction is the only place machine learning has been successful in modern processors, at least in the hardware design. I mean, machine learning has been successful everywhere, of course, in many places, but it has not made its way into actual hardware designs as much. Accelerators have made their way, but that's a different thing. Accelerating machine learning is different from machine, using machine learning to design systems or even do dynamic optimizations. Okay, well, if there are no questions, for, for, for the first time, we're going to leave early. <laughs> and you can, uh, we'll, we'll post the lab today so I can get started on your new lab. Now that branch prediction ideas are fresh in your mind. <laughs> Okay, I'll see you next week.